Hi, Steve. Hi, Sean. Hey, guys. You know, I was thinking about how lucky I was to be on the stage with you guys, and I was thinking, you know, it took, it took four evangelists to write the New Testament, but here, <laughs> right on the stage in front of you, you have the guy who rewrote the Bible of how to start up and rewrote the Bible of marketing in Sean Ellis. So we're lucky to have you here, guys. Um, let's, let's start at the beginning. Steve, um, one of the best ways to define what something is, in your case, the lean startup technique, is to define what it's not. And the one thing it most definitely is not is a business plan. So what's wrong with business plans? Yeah, so one of the things we figured out after 50 years of uh, doing entrepreneurship in Silicon Valley and doing startups is that, get ready for it, startups aren't smaller versions of large companies. Now, that might seem intuitively obvious, but for 50 years, investors in Silicon Valley and elsewhere said to startups that you do everything large companies do. They write business plan, you write a business plan. They write a five-year forecast, we want you to write a five-year forecast. They hire sales, marketing, biz dev, we want you to do that, and they build products with waterfall engineering, you too. And, you know, we did that, and, like, we were kind of surprised that after we launched the product, we used to think the biggest problem we were going to have is, did we have a big enough office to put all the bags of money that were going to come on day one? <laughs> and we were always surprised that that didn't happen. And the reason why is no business plan survives first contact with customers. It turned out that we were using a methodology that was perfect for large corporations, but we had no tools at all that actually made sense when instead of executing a series of knowns, like in a large company, we were dealing with a series of unknowns, which are what a startup was. And so myself, Eric Reese, and Alexander Osterwalder, and then later, of course, with Sean's work, put together this idea called the Lean Startup, which is very, very, very different from how to write a business plan. All right, good, good, all right. We'll hold it there for a second. Sean, I'm gonna put the same question to you. What is growth hacking? And how, uh, how is growth hacking different from what everyone thinks of when they think of marketing? Okay, so um, marketing is something that's been around for a really long time, and it starts with this annual marketing plan, and uh, it's, it's based on kind of a set of channels that don't change a whole lot over time, and all of us know that channels change really quickly today. And so uh, growth hacking is really... It's, it's not that annual planning cycle that marketing is. It's, it goes in weekly sprints. It's a process of, of testing and figuring out what's going to work kind of week to week, monitoring that, taking advantage of the data feedback loops, really learning when something works, doubling down on it. And so it's not annual planning cycles. It's not awareness building. A lot of marketing is about awareness building. I used to have startups all the time say, uh, can you come and help us build awareness for our startup? You, you don't have budgets close to being big enough to build awareness. Focus on sustainable customer acquisition with a return on investment and just keep cycling money based on that and you'll build awareness over time through experiences. So that's on the contrast to marketing. It's also, there's a lot of like, misunderstandings with growth hacking. It's not some magic bag of, uh, of hacks that you can just apply in any business. It's actually more of a process of testing and figuring out what's gonna work. And uh, that, those, are, those are probably the, the, the biggest definers of what it's not. Okay, all right, all right, good. Uh, Steve, when I think of the kind of the pillars of, of the lean startup technique, I think of three things. I think of um, except that the business model is a hypothesis that you have to get out of the building and talk to customers and you need to practice agile build techniques. I could go now. You, you just gave the... <coughs> oh, no. <laughs> you need to explain those. So it, it turns out that... Um, how many of you are passionate founders? Come on. All right. Um, how many of you believe you're visionaries? Come on. Raise your hand. So, so the good news is most of you are hallucinating. <laughs> The bad news is we don't know which one. And the Lean Startup methodology is just a way to figure out whether you're hallucinating or you're visionary without spending lots of time and money to do so. The Lean methodology starts with even though you truly believe on day one, you understand customers' problems, and all you need to do is build that app or ship that product or get that hardware out, and the piles of money will come in, Lean says that's not how the world works. Lean says that all you have on day one is a series of untested hypotheses, and I use the word hypotheses at Stanford because my students pay $50,000 a year and want to hear big words. <laughs> but, but outside of Stanford, it just means you're effing guessing. 
<laughs> you're guessing about who your customers are, what your channel is, what product market fit, that is, what features should go with what customers, what's the pricing, what are the other pieces you need. You're mostly just guessing. And the way we used to solve that is, let's build the product, let's ship it, and then we'll find out later no one's buying it, and we'll do rev two, three, and N. And that's okay if you have infinite time, money, resource, and patience, but Lean says there's now a much better way to do that. Why don't we just simply break down what all those hypotheses are? What are the pieces you need to know to build a successful company? Alexander Osterwalder wrote a book called Business Model Generation, and he got the, all these complex ideas down into a single piece of paper with nine boxes on it called the Business Model Canvas. You all ought to read it. We make you write down your hypotheses. Then step two is the part I invented that says, guess what? There are no facts inside your building, so get the hell outside. Because there's no possible way you could be smarter than the collective intelligence of potential customers and stakeholders and regulators or depending on what your business is. And step three is Eric Reese's contribution that says, why are we building our product serially? Why don't we build our product incrementally and iteratively testing each one of those hypotheses with what's called a minimum viable product? And most of the time, we're going to find out that we're wrong about some part of our business. We got the wrong customer segment. We got the wrong pricing. Maybe feature three should be feature one, or these other six features aren't needed. Lean says we're allowed to be wrong because we could do something called a pivot. And a pivot is defined as a substantive change to one or more of those business model hypotheses. We got something wrong. But instead of spending money or firing a VP of sales or firing the head of engineering, we simply fire the plan before we fire the people. What was your question? <laughs> <laughs> I forget. Yeah. I answered someone. <laughs> Sean. Uh, so uh, growth hacking sounds to me like a lean applied to customer yeah. acquisition and marketing. Yep. Um, but you have a concept that I found really attractive, and, and, the, and the image is really cool, of a flywheel of growth. Uh -huh. Can you explain that? Great. Uh, yeah, that, that ultimately, um, over time, as you're, as it, so it's very similar. You have a hypothesis, you're testing that hypothesis. The more tests you run per week, the more you're going to figure out ways to grow the business. Many of them aren't going to work, some of them will. And over time, you start to build momentum in the business. And that, that gives you that flywheel over time of, uh, you know, generally, if, if what you're optimizing for is a great experience with your product. So growth hacking is not just about external customer acquisition, but it's really about the full funnel, running those experiments through customer acquisition, activation, retention, engagement, everything that drives an experience with the product, that unlocks word of mouth, that unlocks a, a lot more uh, of, the, of the pieces that really drive organic growth, which complements all of the, the tactics that you're figuring out over time. All right, so give me an example of a company that's done that. Uh, so Dropbox, Dropbox, a uh, huge part of Dropbox. Everybody looks at Dropbox and they think, um, oh, well, it's got this natural virality with the, with the sharing that we have with, with uh, folders or with files. And yes, all of those things were important, yet while I was there, the number one source of new users was through uh, just natural word of mouth. People were really excited about it. They loved the experience. They told other people about it. Um, when people try to put lean startup techniques into, into effect, Steve, what do they get wrong most often? Well. Uh, what they get wrong is, okay, I spoke to three customers, I'm done. Um, you, you know, lean is hard, not because anything technically is hard, but it creates cognitive dissonance with founders who believe, you know, let me just build the darn thing, get it out the door, and magic will happen. It's a lot harder to kind of emotionally say, no, even though I believe, let me test a piece of it or some of it or some of my assumptions. And so there's nothing hard technically, but gee, for you to get some relevant data, you know, you need to be talking personally to, you know, at minimum 10 customers a week. And if you're doing a web or mobile app, if you don't have data points from a, a couple of thousand customers, don't even bother to call it lean. Call it what it is. I threw it against the wall and we'll see if something happens. Um, and, and that's okay because there's nothing religious about lean. And you're hearing it from me. It's not a religion. It's not the way to do startups. It happens to be the most efficient way we have right now, but no one is going to run in and kind of smack you on the side of the head, unless you're taking one of my classes, um, <laughs> that, that says you're doing it wrong. It's just that there's now thousands of teams who've been through this who will raise their hand and say, 
boy, is it painful, but we probably saved years, if, if not more, and millions of dollars in doing startups this way. You've, uh, one of the bolder statements you've made is that lean can prevent or at least reduce the high failure rate of startups. So of that's course. always seemed to be part of the, startups the risk have a you take. Huge infant mortality rate for just this reason. Because, again, the passion of an entrepreneur, I mean, they're, what drives most of you to work insane hours, quit real jobs, you know, tell your family like you won't see them anymore and like, <laughs> or whatever. Or, um, you know, that passion creates its own reality distortion field. You have to be the first true believer. And sometimes that reality distortion field blinds yourself to the fact that it is a religion with you, not, there's no data. And so what we're trying to create is evidence-based entrepreneurship. Hmm. So, and the difference is, and, and with all due respect to the people who've been pitching today, you know, when you do a pitch and all you say is, here's my product, here's how smart I am, and here's how big it is, that's a content-free presentation that when I'm an investor, I'm saying, did I like the font? Because you, you gave me no data. What I really want to hear is, what did you think four months ago? What did you believe about customers? What did you believe about product market fit? What did you learn in the last four months on your nickel? And if the answer is nothing, then like, I'm not going to be the first dumb investor. There's plenty of dumb money out there. They're the ones sitting in this audience. Um, <laughs> I'm interested in your velocity and trajectory of learning whether it's users or scale or just data or feedback or something, that you got smarter because it doesn't cost you any money to get smarter. It just costs you some discipline. And when people say that entrepreneurship is not disciplined, I don't know what they're running, but in Lean, it is the most disciplined profession there is. Lean Startups brings evidence and discipline to entrepreneurship along with growth hacking. Sean? Yeah, for sure. And, and if I could just follow on on one thing is that uh, one of the biggest differences between uh, lean startup and growth hacking is that lean startup is, is the full life cycle of the business. Yep. Growth hacking is irrelevant until you have product market fit. If you, if you have not validated that you've created value in the first place, you're just spinning Genius. your wheels if you're trying to acquire customers into an experience where they're not getting real value. And remember, product market fit is just simply what it sounds like. Who are your customers and what parts of the product that you thought they would like do they really like? And if you can't find that fit, then keep looking. Don't just keep shipping a product. You're actually looking for who's the right customer segment, right market, right pricing, right whatever. And when you find it, that's the magic thing called product market fit. And then growth hacking can happen. Uh, Eric. Uh, I, I wanted to put Sean the question I put to you earlier. Uh, when people think they're doing growth hacking and they're, what they're really doing is just hacking, <laughs> what are they doing? What are they getting wrong? So, uh, so one thing is that they would just be kind of randomly doing tests. They just, they're just doing a bunch of things rather than stepping back and, and having a clear hypothesis or guess uh, of, of what's going to happen when I do this and having a process of figuring out what am I going to do first? What am I going to do second? How do I act on the learning that I've gotten from the previous tests that I've run? How do I organize that information so that I get smarter over time and start, when you start to see signal in a channel or in referral loops or whatever it might be that's driving growth in your business, that you double down in that area and you work that vein of gold until you, until you start to flatten out and get those diminishing returns and then you work somewhere else. So I think that's one of the mistakes that people make is that they're just randomly doing some things and most of the people when you ask them how many tests have you run, they're going to be totally off on what the actual numbers are. They'll, they'll think that they're running you know, 10, 20 tests a month when in fact they're actually running three tests per month because it's just a very undisciplined process. But so that when you hold someone accountable to document the number of tests you're running, capture that learning, it becomes a lot more disciplined process, but it's, it's one that becomes additive over time and starts, starts to build growth. Interesting. Steve? Yeah. yeah, so if you really just think about what, what Sean just said, lean startup and, and growth hacking is about 500 years old. That is, what we just reinvented is the scientific method. That is, if you think of the scientific method, how we do science worldwide is we have a hypothesis, we design an experiment, we run the experiment, we get some data, we derive some insight, and we either validate, invalidate, or refine that hypothesis, and that's a loop. That's what makes lean startup and growth hacking incredibly efficient. It truly is not just let's 
you know, pray and spray a set of products out there. There's a methodology that, again, 500 years of running it, we seem to have found more efficient than other things to do. But again, it's counter to the passion of I just want to do it. And that's what makes discipline in Lean. Um, I, I can't let you get off stage, Steve, without asking you about uh, what Lean is doing now. It, one of the, what you just said about basically it's as applic applicable um, to all kinds of business and all kinds of other things as the scientific method. Right. And r lately, uh, you've been applying it to the Defense Department. Tell us about that. So, um, as most of you know, the, uh, at least in the U.S. and worldwide, we're facing threats for security and safety that um, um, are happening at speed that normal governments uh, don't have in their planning cycles. In the U.S., we know how to acquire aircraft carriers for two decades and F-35 fighter planes that take a couple decades. But when ISIS shows up and, and is able to move in days, weeks, and hours, and we're still writing the you know, acquisition plan, there's kind of a mismatch. Turns out the lean methodology has actually been great to start thinking about how to solve some of the safety and security problems for uh, not just Americans, but others around the world. And so we started a version of the lean launchpad class, uh, which had been adopted in the US by all our science uh, research, uh, National Science Foundation, National Institute of Health, adopted the lean methodology to commercialize all science in the United States in the last five years. The Department of Defense uh, is now um, adopting the lean methodology. We have a class called Hacking for Defense, which uh, uses that and is beginning to provide solutions for safety and security uh, across uh, the world. I don't know. I, I probably speak for a lot of people here. I find that really reassuring. Well, we'll, we'll see. Uh, our adversaries are using lean, and so we just need to catch up with them now. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, in fact, I understand that uh, in some captured ISIS documents, uh, the, what there was some of, some of your work was found. <laughs> I, I, I can neither confirm nor deny. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, so now I'm just feeling incredibly guilty. <laughs> um, and if you want to see the class, go to steveblank.com and you'll see a weekly blog on, on what that is. But, but Eric, also large corporations are now using Lean as well. Eric Reese uh, kind of pioneered this with uh, Beth Comstock at GE. But every large corporation is, as you know, being disrupted and uh, trying to adopt the lean methodologies as well. So it's not just for startups, it's for every type of business we have. Sean, you talked a, a bit about this question when we were out in the, in the lobby. Mm -hmm. Growth hacking is really hard for established companies to pick up, why? Uh, mostly because it's a, um, it's, it's a cultural change and it's one where um, marketing teams are used to running experiments and, and uh, getting that data feedback loop and working pretty quickly. Um, Product teams usually haven't worked at that same pace of experimentation and, uh, and using data to make decisions, but marketing teams are not trusted for probably for good reason <laughs> in deeper in the product. And so uh, for, for driving retention and engagement and conversion, um, you have, uh, that's kind of no man's land where marketing's sort of approach is not welcome there. And so, uh, there's a lot of cultural changes in, in trying, to, trying to figure out who, who actually manages this. And the companies that are doing it well tends to have, tend to have growth teams that sit in the product organization. And, uh, and they're managing cross-functionally, coordinating efforts with marketing and, and engineering and product. But, uh, but it's hard. I mean, that, that in, in bigger companies, and I, I can tell you that our, we had a Growth Hackers conference uh, a couple of months ago. Target sent a lot of people to it. Google sent more people than, than any organization uh, there. Um, Microsoft and, and IBM and others are, are, are really trying to work it, and I think they'll figure it out, but it's just not easy. All right, all right. Last question, philosophical and um, inspirational note. Steve, at the top of your uh, of your homepage, it says entrepreneurship is a calling. What do you mean? Well, um, you know, jobs are great. Normal people have jobs. Um, but founders are called. Um, and, uh, you know, if, you're, if you want a job, you should go get one. It's, uh, it's great in nine to five. There's security and whatever. But um, entrepreneurship is not a job. Any of you thinking you have a job, you ought to actually get a real one. But this is the best calling you could ever have. Um, it's the most exciting journey you're going to be on. Um, so make sure you're signed up to be called. All right. Thank you, guys. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Steve. Sean. Right. Thank you.